Hi guys. Welcome back. Okay, I put my I put my phone on do not disturb. Welcome back to book club. I'm so excited for the book club today. Um to know me is to have had me shove this book down your throat. <laughs> um if you have asked me for a book recommendation in the last 4 months, this is the book that I say I keep having to repurchase acts of service because I'm just giving them away and making everyone read them. And everyone has loved it as much as I have. I devoured this book. I read it in one day. Um, and I'm so excited that Lillian herself is coming on today. Um, before I bring her on, I want to talk a little bit about why I think books like this are so important and just give a brief intro and then we'll bring Lillian on because that's who we all want to hear from. Um, so... In the 60s and 70s, there was a huge wave of literary sex masterpieces, and it was maybe the first time when erotica was considered modern and academic and refined. And, you know, you have authors, especially female authors like Anais Nin, who wrote erotica, and Eve Babbitts. Um, so it was a very important time in the literary world. And it's been argued that there hasn't been anyone like them since. Until The Guardian compared Lillian to them. So that's a very big um, compliment and also very true. So I guess without further ado, let's bring Lillian on. This is the part that I'm so good at, as everyone knows. Hi, Kaya. Yay! How are you? Hi. Hi. It's so How amazing to be here and hear you say these things about acts of service. It's like amazing. Thank you. Oh my. I um. It's nice to be able to say them to your face, but like I truly have been forcing everyone in my life to read this book. I think it's so amazing. Yeah. It's your first yeah. novel, correct? Okay, amazing. First, for people who haven't done their homework, how do you describe this book to people who um, haven't read I it? I like to keep it very short and sweet and say it's about a woman who gets involved with a couple and uh, things get complicated and juicy for the three of them. Yeah. Correct. And okay, so for your first novel, did you set out to write a book about sex or did you use sex as a way to explore identity as I a I mean, whole. both, but I actually did. Yeah, I did set out to write a book about sex. I guess it, they didn't seem separable to me at the time. Like, I knew that I was really absorbed in the problem of, like, yeah, sex as this vessel or this oracle where a lot of things that are hard to reconcile come together. Um, and I knew, yeah. yeah, I thought it was a really rich subject to tease out in a novel because I think a lot happens um, in the moment, both like internally and also physically in the room. And I love that combination. Yeah, yeah. I want to get this quote right, because in a, an interview, it's been mentioned that you grew up in a, quote, small, uncharacteristically red Massachusetts town. How do you feel like your upbringing affected your creative process and the way you explore topics like sex and sexuality? You know, it's a really good question and it's complicated. I think um, I was like queer very young or like I thought of myself as a queer person when I was a teenager and I was in not, certainly not the worst place in yeah. the world for that to be true. Like it wasn't very, um, it wasn't yeah. traumatic at all, but it also was quite lonely. Like I didn't know anyone else who was queer at the time. And I think it did make me me conceive yeah. of my relationship to like sex and desire and attraction and like social culture around sex as like very confused and I was I definitely had a sense that it didn't make sense to me and that I needed to like look at it in different contexts in order to understand it and I think yeah I think by the yeah. time I was in my early 20s in New York I was like oh that actually that's sort of true of everyone. I had I had sort of felt that this was like a private experience I was having being in this context in my hometown and, and wanting to be in a larger urban context and 
like be around other people. But I think, I think even, even m many of us who didn't conceive of our sexuality as like different or confusing when we were young, like realize as we grow up that in fact, it's mm -hmm. like much more fraught than we realized. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And you, you chose to have this place in New York. Do you think that this story specifically could have existed anywhere? Was there a reason you chose New York? Like you talk about wanting to move to a city where maybe you would feel less alone and people were more open minded. Like, was that why you chose to have no, it take place I, in New York? but I do. It was important to me that it take place in New York. And I do think in, a, in its own very specific way, because it takes place in such a narrow world, like it is quite a New York book for me. And I think it's because do you, you find it yeah. so too. Yeah, I think it's because I have one of my favorite things about New York in the sense that I've always had about it is like, it's so dense and there are so many different layers of like social worlds and landscapes like on top of each other in New York and you can be in the same place again and again and each time be in a different like layer of the city that you've never witnessed before or knew existed. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really, that's so yeah. key to how Eve feels when she gets in the room with Nathan and Olivia, right, is like, she, um, she really feels like she's in this same landscape that she lives in. She's even with people that aren't, like, outside of her world, and yet she, like, hasn't been able to access this room. And that, for me, feels very New York in a way. Yeah. I, I was, how old were you was when actually you moved 18, to New York? for college. Yeah, mm. I was, I was the same age. And yeah, it felt like this sort of like small town knowing, you know, the same people my whole life. And then all of a sudden, it was like, every day, there was this whole new wave of self discovery. And, and it, yeah, the layers of, you know, even staying within the same community, but finding new things, yeah. I think is very true to New York. Yeah. And you it said in, in, in an interview that you read mm. fiction for the New Yorker. What kind of what kind of stories were resonating with you, and how do you feel like those affected yeah, your writing? Yeah, it's like a twofold question because, like, even before I was reading for the New Yorker, like the magazine was a big part of my life. Like, I always read New Yorker fiction, and there have been some stories over the years that have been like so influential for me from that magazine, like. There's this amazing story um, called The Metal Bowl. It's a Miranda July story. I want to say maybe like 10 years ago and like some incredible Lori Moore stories about love and sex from the 90s that I think are like life changing. Um, but I think the experience I had working there, it's different, right? Because that was more like I was working there reading fiction at the same time that I was in graduate school for fiction and also reading like a lot of my peers work and I think that experience was so much a process of like um, getting really in touch with knowing immediately when you read something like whether you trust it whether you want to go on that journey with the writer right and that's yeah. like it's very instinctual it's very hard to define yeah. everyone has a different metric for it and some things will resonate with you and not with me but I think you know I'm still honing that but it was useful for honing that for sure. Yeah. Um, and okay, <laughs> now we'll get into the book because I have so many questions. I have a whole list right here. So if I'm looking down, that's why. Um, so the book opens with mm. Eve posting nudes online. Um, can we talk a little bit about the dichotomy of her doing this for attention, but also doing yeah, it anonymously? It's, it's, it's a really good question. I mean, I think there are so many different ways in which we want attention, right? And like, the thing that she's doing, I think a lot of us crave it, but we don't have a lot of um, outlets for it, which is like, in a way, wanting to know how we would be judged anonymously without someone knowing us, without someone loving us, without someone wanting to get approval from us or be yeah. nice to us. And if you have an interaction online that isn't anonymous, right, and that your name is on and your face is on, like, there is that real social dynamic, or you hope there is, where like, you're really interacting in order to connect with each other or at least like accept each other in a way. And I think sometimes we really crave um, like knowing where we 
understand in in this way that is usually so unspoken right like knowing where we stand in the social world like Eve really yeah. wants to know like how do I hold up how do I look to people who don't know me um yeah, yeah. and I think a lot yeah. of us like we we want an outlet for that in some way yeah 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 and you've mentioned in an interview that you think Eve's desire to be desired is a product of the internal foil of the training we're given to compete with other women, which I think is very true. Um, and you say Eve's vanity is emerging from that very early socialization. So do you think that Eve is a result of how she's been socialized? Yeah, I mean, I think everything in the book is about this, this dualism of socialization and, and selfhood and what you choose for yourself, right? And reconciling those things is so hard. Like, I think mm -hmm. it's both, like, so much of what she's grappling with is what she's been taught to value about herself as a woman by men, by her culture. And then also like how she thinks about herself on her own, how she's trying to resist that, um, you know, what seems precious to her that yeah. people value in her. It's so convoluted and I don't think it can ever really be disentangled, you know, like that's the pleasure of fiction in life. Yeah, yeah. And um, Eve experiences Nathan as a false god, but a god nonetheless. Um, was it difficult to portray infatuation as both enchanting and belittling? At the you same know, time? that was the easiest part and the thing that felt like the center of the book to me and so natural. Like, I, I think it's so, yeah. I, mean, I do think they have a unique relationship and it's special to me. But at the same time, like, we have such a trope about that dynamic you know like it's so culturally accepted that like we're attracted to what's dangerous we're attracted to what we don't understand like the erotic is so much about yeah. the unknown and the terrifying and the opposite of the familiar right and so like it makes so much sense to me that she's attracted to something that like wants to get near her is interested in her but is like really really terrifying to her at the same time and yeah that dynamic felt so natural to me like that's mm -hmm. what held the whole book together yeah 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 and I've I've read that you talk about the Oscar Wilde's quote um everything in the world is about sex except for sex sex is about power which I love um something I loved about the way you chose to write Eve's thoughts is like the audience is experiencing her sort of battling herself. And I think that the power disparity between Eve and Nathan is quite clear, but what about between Eve and herself? It's, yeah, that's a complicated question. I mean, yes, yeah, she is battling with herself. I don't know. I think the thing that's so active in all these relationships, right, is like the, the dynamic is always shifting. Like, I think the the part of yeah. Eve that is censoring herself and really wants to be in control of how she's received, especially by someone like Olivia, is, like, winning out for so much of the book. And then, for me, what's exciting and transformative about it is, like, the willing the willingness, I guess, to, to believe that that other experience is actually deeper and that she sort of allows it to take hold yeah. of her um but yeah, yeah i think i think there's so much internal battling for all of them and and part of what is so um enigmatic and exciting about nathan is that he seems he seems clearer in his own way you know like i don't think he's he doesn't have an internal yeah. battle in the same way and that's it's you know, you know no it's crazy making yeah no <laughs> And a love triangle is at the center of this all. Do you think that Eve would have had the same sort of path to self-discovery had Olivia been absent or had mm. Nathan been absent? No, you know, I think that the dynamic between the three of them is so crucial because it has to do with being witnessed, reconciling, like how Eve wants to be in front of someone that she considers a peer, right? In front of another woman, in front of someone that she feels both protective toward and self-conscious around. Um, having the experience that she's having with Nathan, like of desire, of sex, but also of 
um, like self-censorship and self-hatred, like, you know, she can have that experience in a different room and, and people do every day, I think, but I don't think it would force her into the same, um, like struggle and reconciliation with herself if she didn't have to like bring those two different selves that are really at odds together, the self that she would be around someone with Olivia and then the self that she would be around someone like Nathan. Yeah. 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 And I think a feeling that comes up a lot for queer women particularly is a feeling of betrayal or trying to reconcile queer identity when in a heterosexual relationship. Um, the Eve experience this, like, can you talk about diving deeper into these complex feelings that, you know, are, are that come along with being pan or bisexual and, you know, when it can be argued that being in a relationship of any gender composition should be a celebration of yeah, sexuality. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think even as we try and, like, embrace every form of relationship that we have, and of course, like, I believe in that, there are still all of these old dynamics yeah. that are circling and that we're aware of and that we're, like, handling unconsciously in our lives all the time. And I do think that's a huge um, problem for Eve in the start of the book, right, is like that she wants to not just think of herself as a queer person, which she is, but that it's not just sexual to her, it's also political, like there's a value landscape that's part of it. Yeah. And she feels like choosing yeah. to be with women is somehow like in line with her values or like is a form of um, like self-actualization rather than capitulation or something. And I think like there's a lot of truth in yeah. that and there's a huge history to that choice. And like, it is a, it is a deeply political choice for a lot of people. Um, and I think it's, it's a political choice to the end for her. She just, she just changes the way she relates to it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like, um, it's not just a matter of sexuality. Yeah. Or it's a matter of identity. And I think that, yeah. Um, okay. So do you, do you think in this like power disparity and in this battle, do you think there can ever be a clear winner, even when it's between Eve and Ooh. herself? <laughs> Sorry. What do you mean? Like a winner, a winner in I what way? Like, do you think that, because what, the thing that I really loved about your book, which I don't think a lot of authors achieve is this exploration that's happening you know bring it you're bringing us along on the exploration yeah. it's not like i figured it out and this is what i think about this thing because you're you're quite literally like witnessing eve try to figure it out and you're hearing all of her different thought processes but like by the end do you think that she came to a clear conclusion on on that identity mm. and do you think within the clarity specifically between her and herself, there can ever really be a clear winner. Yeah, I, I don't think there can be. I think there's so little clarity in our identities. And also, I feel like it's a short book and it takes place over just about a year. So it's hard to convey this at the level of like a life. But I think that's so much about Eve's experience with the two of them and the way that she approaches her sexuality and her growth in the book is like premised on this feeling that like we don't really have an innate identity like to find and hold on to in a way and that like it it can yeah. be that she had this like history as a queer person and she's having this transformative experience with Nathan and like that can change again you know like it's not that she's discovered that actually yes. like this is how she feels about men or this is the type of relationship she can have with someone like Nathan but that like she had this transformative experience and like she'll go on to have a different one and there isn't like a sexuality that she has to be loyal to and I think that's so important yes. to me and and what I wanted to do in the book and it really is premised on the sense that yeah, there, not only can there not be a winner, but there can't even be, for me, I think, or for Eve, like, a state of permanence or, like, a loyalty, you know? Yeah. yeah. And you talk about loyalty, and I think it's interesting because you're saying, like, a, not being 
loyal to a sexuality doesn't mean yeah. you're not being loyal uh. to yourself or to your community. Um, and I think you, you talk a lot about that in the book um, when you say it's political, because in feeling, you know, this sense of like, am I betraying a community that I want to belong to? she then starts to feel like maybe she does have to be loyal yeah. to one sexuality. I think that, yeah, I mean, it's simplistic, but I think that's one of the hardest things about the ways that we're articulating sexuality and identity now, even though they can be very liberating, is at the same time, like, it is so de devastating and reductive to feel that you would have or should have a loyalty to, like, a decision that you made about yourself or a discovery that you had about yourself or a, something that you claimed rather than to like your dynamic experience yeah yeah and do you have a character well i guess this is a two-part question when you started writing the book did you have a character that you related the most yeah to? i do think i relate the most to eve because eve is um Eve is like actively grappling with something and and trying to sort it out as she has the experience and I think that's definitely the way that I think and the way that I approach um life and art I think whereas I do think like yeah. Nathan isn't that way I think that Olivia is having an experience like that but in a really different way that feels really private and um sacred and I think yeah. Olivia is the type yeah. of person who like it's not it's not troubling for her in the same way or she wouldn't she wouldn't tease it out um socially or in a piece of art or or try to um like untangle it for herself as much as just like live inside it the confusion yeah yes yes and by the end of the of writing the book was there anything that surprised you about this process of exploration yeah so many things i don't even know where to start there's a um there's i don't want to give too much away but there's like an escalation that takes place in the second half of the book um where like the three of them are sort of forced to like uh address their relationship and its dynamics in like a more public way and that I never expected. Yeah. Like it took me, um, yeah, that wasn't oh. in my mind at all. Like I was working on these scenes between the three of them and developing their dynamic and how it feels to Eve. And it took me a long time to realize that I needed them to, um, to grapple with what was going on, like to leave the sphere of privacy in a way, which is like so protective and, and yeah. allows Eve to like yeah. feel so internally conflicted without having to face like anything but her own internal censure. Um, and that that was probably the biggest yeah. surprise and like yeah. also the biggest excitement of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that took me so off guard and I'm not gonna spoil it because I do want everyone to have that same surprise. Um, so you did not set out like you didn't know not at all this is gonna happen okay yeah wow i i never work with an um, outline and i wish that yeah. i did because i feel like i'm totally flying in the dark flying blind <laughs> um but at least it's exciting oh my yeah wow so you just start and then it's like do you feel like when you're writing you start to get to know the characters more and it's almost like you're like getting more familiar with them and then they sort of guide yeah, you not entirely but it will be obvious to me if something is wrong for them for sure yeah yeah nice okay okay um okay well is there, there what's what's happening next like are you writing are you what are what <laughs> please give me <laughs> another book. i'm writing and i would absolutely love to give you another book i'm so pleased that you Uh oh <laughs> oh wait you're muted for oh you're back you're back <laughs> love to do it again yeah um well we're all very excited thank you so much for doing this i've been looking forward to this for so long 
Um, and congrats on your paperback coming out. It's very exciting. And we're going to be giving some away to people who are watching. So thank you, um, you thank so much. You, I can you, only thank see what you. you're reading next. I know. Well, it might be erotica now. Honestly, now after talking about Nason, and I'm like, I think that it's going to maybe be some erotica. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>